Very good. Who, who is it? Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium for Tuesday, October 8, 2024. It's wonderful to see so many people here. I think we're setting a record for attendance in our new location here in the library. Thanks to the library staff for rustling up extra chairs so that, that we can make room for all of you. Today is a special day in the life of the colloquium. So before introducing today's speakers, I need to tell you a little bit about our colloquium's namesake. You may wonder why it's called the Malcolm Renfrew Colloquium. And it's not about chemistry or only occasionally about chemistry. And we're right across from the chemistry building known as Renfrew Hall. Malcolm Renfrew was born October 12, 1910 in Spokane, grew up in Colfax, Washington and Potlatch, earned bachelor's and master's degrees in chemistry here at the University of Idaho, joined the faculty in 1959 and was head of the chemistry department until his retirement in 1976. And I'm going to invite my co-coordinator, Dan Buckvich, to tell you a little bit more about Malcolm's connection with this event and why it has his name, Dan. Back in 2020, a faculty members named Michael O'Rourke and Rick Barenbach and myself were humanities fellows in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. And one of our assignments was to come up with a thing that might involve the entire university. So we came up with this colloquium series that at the time was just called, I think it was called Tools Are Us. <laughs> and it was about what tools we use in all of the different labs on campus. And at every colloquium was Dr. Renfrew. Here's a photo of him probably what from the 70s i think maybe the, the early 80s yeah some of you here i know remember dr renfrew others were born probably in 2020 <laughs> but dr renfrew was at every colloquium and always had great suggestions about we should be for the next one how we might involve more people on campus and on his 100th birthday uh dr renfrew lived to 103? 103. 103. On his 100th birthday, we decided to name the colloquium for him. And one of his favorite professors, Dr. Janine Shree in chemistry, came up with this cool quote. She thought Malcolm was a painter of blue skies because he was a painter, great watercolorist. And he, as a department head, he was a person who was always optimistic, so painter of blue skies. And that plaque for many years was over in what used to be called the Commons. What's it now? I saw it. And moved to this great location in the library. So thanks for having us. So today we rededicate that plaque and this space as the Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium Presentation Space. So you are part of a historic moment and I hope you'll take a moment uh, after we uh, adjourn today to have a cookie or some lemonade or iced tea in honor of Malcolm Renfrew and take a look at the plaque and the photograph. If you're here for the first time, the beauty of the colloquium is that the topic changes every week. We invite faculty members, postdocs, uh, graduate students, visiting scholars to talk about their teaching, scholarship, sometimes outreach and extension activities. And so uh, it's a, an open call at the end of every semester uh, for presentations for the following semester. <laughs> So I want to give a quick preview of next week's program. Uh, in this space, uh, we will hear from two repeat presenters, Terry Sewell from Computer Science and Barry Robeson from Biological Sciences. 
and their topic is the hows, whys, and why nots of developing educational video games on campus. And so if you're familiar with the Polymorphic Games Lab over in the IRIC, um, you may be curious about uh, what they do over there and how these video games relate to the University of Idaho's educational mission. Today, however, we are thrilled to have two presenters from different areas of the university. And this is a great example of the interdisciplinarity of this place in that uh, they both contacted us independently uh, with a proposal. And we realized that rather than having them present separately, uh, we should have them on the same program. So uh, we're going to hear about uh, Idaho forest lookouts, but from two perspectives, one looking at their legacy and then one looking forward to the future. So our first presenter is Michael Decker from the College of Graduate Studies. Uh, he'll talk about field work as a fire watcher and a researcher conducting interviews with U.S. Forest Service staff and collecting photo documentation of lookouts in the most remote parts of Idaho. Michael is an avid hiker and trail runner who loves fire lookouts, as you'll hear, and he is interested in uh, place-based thought and centered living experiences. The second speaker is Andrea Alberto Duto, uh, an assistant professor in the College of Art and Architecture. And he has uh, done research in Canada and in Europe. And his current research focuses on experimental shelter typologies designed in response to energy and environmental crises. Uh, and then we'll have time for uh, questions and maybe a little feedback between the, the two presenters. Uh, so let's start off with uh, Michael. Yeah. Good. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, thank you everybody so much for being here today. I have to admit, I didn't realize it was going to be uh, such a huge crowd. So, uh, thank you so much. And uh, my name is Michael Decker. Uh, I was an English MA uh, here at the University of Idaho. I graduated back in 2021. Uh, and like Ken said, I currently work as a director over at the College of Graduate Studies, so I still see uh, many of you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on for about the last three and a half years. Uh, it's called Keeping Watch, Mapping Idaho's Fire Lookouts Through uh, Lived History. Uh, Keeping Watch is a geospatial narrative project that embeds the lived history oral testimonies of uh, former and current fire lookouts along a GIS uh, web-based near base. <laughs> Before I get into the project and show you around um, the project that we came up with, I do want to extend um, some thanks to many of the partners that made this project possible. So first and foremost, I want to thank the University of Idaho Library and the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning who funded this project through an Idaho or through a library seed grant. So that really gave us the startup funds to be able to travel around to the fire towers and interview all the different lookouts. Um, could, just couldn't happen without that. And I also want to extend a special thank you to Devin Becker and the CBIL who um, provided uh, really all of the web design expertise that, that made this project possible. We couldn't have done it without Devin. So um, I think the kind of work that Devin, he's in the back, uh, shout out, shout out Devin. Um, really, uh, the kind of work that, that Devin's doing up in the CBIL um, is, is super valuable, specifically for humanities students. They do a lot of really good work to legitimize the humanities here on campus, so I'm really thankful for them. Uh, also, the Confluence Lab, which is an interdisciplinary group here on campus. Uh, Jen Levino, I also see, is there in the back, and Jen uh, was there in the beginning of this project and gave us uh, just a ton of guidance, particularly on the humanities content that helped shape this project. Uh, also, thank you to the U.S. Forest Service who provided a lot of historical images that we use, and also to the Idaho Department of Lands, uh, and specifically Pam Onim, um, who 
gave me the opportunity to actually uh, work as a fire lookout for part of the summer of 2021, which was a particularly bad fire season that you all remember because we had a, a drought uh, in the spring and then we had a heat dome event where we had the hottest ever recorded temperatures in the Northwest that um, kind of all compounded and produced a particularly bad uh, forest fire season. But I think that, that that experience, this would be have been a much different project had I not had that experience. So um, thank you to the IDL and the PAM. I'm wearing my fire lookout shirt um, underneath my college <laughs> shirt, which I hope is um, symbolic of how I'd like to approach uh, this project, everything, really. Um, also, thanks to my collaborators, Chris Lamb and Jack Cordell. Uh, they helped write the proposal to help uh, get Keeping Watch funded. They also um, you know, helped build a relationship with the CDIL. They've done similar types of mapping projects that help guide this, guide this project. Um, they also interviewed all of the workouts with me in the summer of 21. And they're just the best buds and collaborators I got down for. Uh, Jack's in the back, um, just in casual. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and also thank you to the lookouts themselves who uh, allow us into their homes, uh, up into their lookouts, which is the same thing for some of them, um, and shared stories about their lives, shared um, you know uh, opinions of agencies and, and forest management practices, and you know told us about their philosophies on life. And it's really just been a tremendous honor to to get to know many of them and to spend the past three and a half years uh, with their stories. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge, too, that the, uh, the lookouts themselves are located on many of the um, homelands of, of indigenous tribes in this area, in that it is probably would be um, impossible and certainly irresponsible not to, to do a kind of historicizing and deep reading of lookouts without acknowledging that they are not just symbolic, but also physical manifestations of the kind of colonial violence and indigenous erasure. So many of these lookouts are on the homelands of Nez Perce, Danny Poo, Shoshone Bay, uh, tribe, the Pekin tribe of Northern Idaho, parts of the Coeur d'Alene, and um, uh, outskirts of the Coeur Reservation as well. So, but I really just want to jump in um, and just show you the project. I don't want to hang out in slides. I just want to show you what we came up with. So, let's see if we can. Yeah, great. So, this is Keeping Watch. This is the homepage um, that we came up with. Like I said, it is um, an interactive GIS interface. So this thing is, uh, you can move it around. You can put it over there. I don't know why I want to put it over there. But um, we also have some buttons that take you to different parts of the site. But I really want to take some time to just focus on the map itself, which is really the central feature of this project. So um, just to explain a little bit, you see we have the, the shape of Idaho here. And then a series of gray dots interspersed with larger blue circles. The, um, these represent still standing fire lookouts in the state. Um, and the larger blue circles represent uh, what's called the scene area or the 20 mile radius around the tower that a fire watcher lookout is responsible for, for watching out over located fires. And um, it was also a uh, if you zoom in, you see a, a more detailed map um, layer emerges. Um, but this this was a pretty intentional design decision because, as you can see, there are many um, overlapping scene areas, right? And um, I wanted to uh, do this for a couple reasons. A, I think that the deep, you know, this this mapping structure is. Um, particularly good for a project like this because I wanted to have a multitude of perspectives um, and viewpoints represented in a singular space. But it also literally shows the system that fire watchers use to, to locate fires. Even still, the ideal is, is that you would have um, an individual inside of the tower with a podium in the center of the tower upon which sits a uh, large uh, steel alligator with a uh, uh, like a site at the end of it, and they oscillate this thing around and they shoot out an azimuth as a smoke or a fire. And they then relay that to um, a dispatcher somewhere. And ideally, you would have two other lookouts doing the exact same thing. And then the dispatcher takes sort of the, the average of all of these readings and then they produce, they kind of triangulate um, a location that they send out to a crew who then responds to the fire. And so I, that's a design decision to, you know, kind of get at some of the heavier philosophical ideas in the project, but also to literally represent how um, how they how they locate fires in the first place. 
So let me go up. But I want to show you what happens when you click inside of one of these things. <laughs> um, so you click into the towers. You see that the first thing that comes up is a 360 degree photograph of the inside of these towers. Um, that's Bill. Bill is in charge of the volunteer fire lookout program on uh, Diablo Mountain Lookout in the Salvador Wilderness. Uh, it was also a pretty good interview as well. And then the anatomy is, like I said, pretty similar. It's actually exactly the same in all these towers. So you have this topographical <laughs> feature off to the left, and then you have the year the lookout was built, whether it's staffed or unstaffed. And then the architectural style uh, for lookout. And this is kind of a fun little feature we came up with right here, where you can click on it, and then there's an explanation of um, what style of cabin this is. This is an R6. An R6 is a 15 by 15 foot <laughs> cab, flat top roof, wraparound, catwalk, concrete base, a double room storage, like a storage unit. Um, the R6 largely replaced what's called the L4, which is a smaller cabin um, that was pretty popular up until about the 50s or 60s, and R6s. Um, uh, began replacing them. And the reason why the, the R6 and the L4 is the most common style that you'll see is because they are pre fab kits that can be packed up on horses or mules or helicoptered in. And so they were they were easy to build. They also kind of represent um, a kind of standardization um, that became, you know, obviously the, the Forest Service uh, kind of adopted for, for a lot of their procedures and protocols. Um, and then if you go down, we have all of the different uh, media that we collected for each tower. So these are our different uh, interviews with Bill. Um, and then I have here, you can see there's a, here's a photo of me talking to him. Uh, I'm clearly making some kind of a very vivid <laughs> point. I'm just like getting into a tone or something. Um, probably making no sense. Um, but you can also see that was a pretty, pretty smoky day. Uh, there's kind of a white purgatory uh, behind me and um, that was because the Lolo complex fires were burning nearby. So uh, that same day, uh, Bill was actually evacuated from Yellow Mountain Lookout uh, because of fires. Uh, we actually, on our way out, drove past all the road closure signs that had been put up uh, after we um, after we had gone in. So was, that was kind of exciting. And it's kind of cool that he took the time, even though he was uh, about to be evacuated, he still sat down, brewed us a pot of coffee, and talk to us for like three hours. Um, <laughs> so he's just, uh, it was just a pretty cool experience. Uh, and I think that's just like very uh, emblematic of a lot of the experiences we have with fire lookouts. They were very gracious. They were very willing to talk to us, um, even uh, during imminent fire danger. Um, so I want to, uh, I'm gonna go back out. I'm gonna go into a different lookout <laughs> because I wanna show you what some of these lookouts uh, or what some of the interviews we conducted look like and kind of how we ran them. So um if I go into Hell's Half Acre, uh, I'll show you this this 360 photo. It's a pretty good one. So we have uh, Patrick McCarran here. I'm gonna zoom around to Patrick. He is a towering, very kind man. Um and he gave us uh just the best uh interview. I want to show you uh, a clip of him. We asked all of our lookouts uh, one question. They all kind of got the same question. That is, um, what is lost in the transition away from the human staff fire lookout? I'm going to pause here for a second and just say that, you know, a lot of, um, you know, what we were looking at in this project is uh, trying to understand that move away from, the, from the, the human staff fire lookout and what that says about the changing human relationship to space and place. And um, lookouts gave us tons of very answers about what is lost and the move away from um, fire lookouts, right? And, and also, I want to say that this, this move away is, you know, it's not something that's new, right? Fire lookouts kind of come to their zenith at the end of World War II, and then, you know, a lot of people come back from the war and, you know, can use wartime technologies mainly. Um, aerial surveillance began to kind of replace the fire lookout, and over the last 80 years or so, it's experienced kind of a growing, a growing obsolescence, and it's really kind of always trying to make this argument for its own existence and why it should, uh, you know, um, remain. So anyway, we asked people what they thought was lost in that move away. And I think that Patrick gives a really good response in that he um, kind of summarizes 
uh, all the different kinds of answers that we're getting. So I'm just going to play this clip really quick, and then um, I'll jump back in uh, afterwards. We're interested in, in this project that we're doing is um, kind of the increasing in obsolescence of the yeah, so if you could talk a little bit. Yeah, well, as far as technological advancement goes, I'm at the sticks and rot stage. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, this is, as a, these have a huge historical significance, you know, and I'm talking some of the stuff they tell people at St. Mary. These, this is probably, the first look out here was probably in the 30s. It was what I would call a rag top. There was no, there was no lookout. There's a post here, maybe a tree. And the guy lived in the tent. And then from there, it escalated. In the 30s, uh, there were about 50 lookouts in Ravala County in the Bitterroot National Forest. It gave a lot of people jobs. And yeah, it gets to be redundant. But there is there are things to be said about a human being being here. You know, yeah, you can set up the machinery and it can monitor the weather and the winds and everything else, but uh, just walk around the catwalk every 15 minutes or so, you see things that, you know, when you're here long enough, there's a difference. You can tell. Uh, also, I mean, steep canyons, especially here, it's just canyon country. Uh, the fire crews are working on a fire down here and have to stay overnight on it. They can't radio out. They can radio here, but they can't radio. They can't reach dispatch. So the lookouts are all relaying messages. That can get really critical. That can be, you know, a life or death situ situation. And there are a lot of just little, you know, things. I know we're in the modern age. The whole management of the Forest Service is changing to, uh, you know, new people who don't really understand the significance of having to pack all your supplies in a mule train. This, <laughs> this is a little different here. You can drive here, but there are quite a few lookouts that are still packed in. So, uh, and also, uh, you know, financially, you know, what does it cost to pay a lookout for a season? Probably what it costs an hour for the helicopter. You know, what it costs in a day for the aerial reconnaissance. And there are aerial, aerial reconnaissance when it's clear enough to see in fire season. And they go along between the lookouts and radio each lookout. And we radio back what to look at, what to look for, what we saw. So, and the sermon is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to uh, just preface that by saying that I didn't check any of those numbers, so um, <laughs> seems to be making a good, a good point. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but really, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can just listen to it and lose those characters laughing. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to show that because uh, it really, uh, to me, it, it gets it three different types of arguments uh, for why we should continue to have lookouts that I try to <laughs> intersperse throughout the larger project. And I'm actually going to do that. I'm going I'm I'm to click on the home page, and I just want to have behind me the overlapping um, scene areas, right? So, you know, you kind of have this idea that, that the reason why we use a, a structure like this really is, again, to have a multitude of, of perspectives and thoughts on fire lookouts, you know, um, that exist in one space. Because a lot, a lot of problems that are connected to fire lookouts, it's really complicated, and it's something that has to find ways to um, accommodate many different perspectives um, and opinions on how we should or shouldn't be managing these spaces. But something that comes out as like three distinct things in the answer to this, uh, you know, what you know, what is lost in the movement away is really three arguments for why we should or shouldn't have fire lookouts. And I think there's a lot of people who care really deeply about continuing to have these structures, but the argument is largely a historical one. <laughs> uh, you know, these are important symbols of some kind of Western heritage, and they remind us of, you know, the same, you know, not just the successful management policies we've had over the last hundred years, but also the ones that maybe have been problematic as well. And, you know, fire lookouts are important to remind us of that. But that argument doesn't necessarily hold water for the different agencies that are um, funding them. Right, so if you're talking about the Forest Service and the IDL and the BLM and you know, some of the timber protection agencies that still 
um, you know, uh, you know, what the fun bees, right? They pay for them. You know, the argument needs to also be one, like Patrick points out, it's historical. It um, has you know, to do with modern use cases, right? So like you're relaying information back from fire crews out in the field to um, you know, to someone you know back in an office somewhere. Uh, you know, you also have um, an economic argument too. He tries to make right there. You know, these are relatively you know we don't pay fire lookouts a ton, right? And in fact, a lot of fire lookouts are volunteers. Myself, right? I I, I didn't get paid to be up there. I just went up there because it was kind of fun. Um, and, and so. You know, I really wanted all three of those perspectives to be represented in the same project because I think that you know keeping watch hopefully uh, will lay a, will lay some kind of a um, or contribute to a framework that that helps to make arguments why we should continue to have fire lookouts in the future. Um, the other thing that Patrick talks about is this kind of relationship that fire lookouts create with the land around them, right? That scenery, that twenty mile radius around the tower. And that becomes important. Like he said, he's like, if you if you yeah. stay in one place, if you remain in one place long enough and you walk the catwalk every 15 minutes for a whole summer, you just begin to notice small nuances and differences. And that's something that at least currently technology can't replicate. They can't, they can't replicate this kind of phenomenological relationship to the landscape that human beings are capable of having. And that becomes useful and important. It becomes important for spotting fires, but it also becomes important because we should remain connected to these places, right? We, we should have a point of continuity between us and the landscapes we're making management decisions about. And I was hoping that that keeping watch kind of helps pull all of this together and and um, you know tries to unpack sort of how complicated this this issue can be. Um, the other thing too is that that relationship is just I think important for fostering people who are willing to. Um, advocate for the environment for these places, right? Uh, so I don't think it's a mistake that you have so many people who have become very culturally important to the environment who spent time on lookouts. You have writers in the 50s and 60s like Jack Kerouac and Edward Abbey and Philip Leyland and Norman McLean a little bit earlier than that, but who all spend time on fire lookouts and then go on to write about that experience. You have um, Ray Fressick up in Spokane, uh, who runs the Fire Lookout Museum and wrote the definitive Fire Lookout Bible in the uh, Fire Lookouts of the Northwest, uh, who single-handedly uh, establishes the Salmo Priest Wilderness Area, a wilderness area that I watched over as a Fire Lookout on um, Sunrise Mountain Lookout. You have uh, Norman Borlaug, who uh, was uh, spent time as a, as a young man on a Fire Lookout and then went on to start the Green Revolution, the genetic modification of food. Uh, you have also uh, many politicians in Idaho who have written about spending time with fire lookouts and how that time affected the way that they um, made policy decisions in our state. And so um, I want the lookout to not just be something that's like literally a lookout, but rather kind of a composite or a metaphor for this kind of relationship building that I think is really important. Um, and that I hope um, you know, we continue to have structures. I know that you're going to get into that here and there. We continue to have structures and goals that allow us to, to, to create those kinds of relationships with these spaces. Um, and finally, I want to just, I'm gonna check my time here, make sure I'm not going, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up right now. Um, I wanna end on a question though, that I think Keeping Watch asks too, and it's a, it's a larger question about technology, which is, you know, there's a good chance that a lot of what fire lookouts do can be automated away or, you know, done better by satellites and um, camera systems. Um, but really, lookouts get tied up into this bigger question that we're all kind of thinking about right now um, in regards to a lot of technology, which is just because we can do it, um, should we do it, right? Should we just because, you know, and so I think that that's something that I hope that people who interact with this site and, and click around and watch the interviews um, think about, um, you know, kind of deeply. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want to take up too much time. I know we have another speaker, so I'll, I'll end there and I'm happy to hear questions after this. But uh, thank you so much for, for listening to me today. And then you can pop up your slides. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Vale. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's great to see such a crowd. I would like, first of all, to thank Phil Matt uh, for establishing a contact with the Ramtree Collection Committee. And I also extend a special thank to the head of my department, um, Randy Till and the Dean of the College of Art and Architecture, uh, Shauna Corey, for their encouragement to continue with the work that we present today. Uh, in this presentation, I will share basically an attempt to conduct research with students. Uh, more precisely, um, let's say I understand kind of the design studio as a research space uh, that can basically lead uh, to a larger research project for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the architecture department, basically the design studio is a core teaching subject because it is the moment when the students apply the theoretical concept uh, learned in other courses in a concrete project. They design things. And a special thanks goes to students who passionately participated in last semester's local design studio and the one with currently in progress and there on the, on the table, you can see some of the models that were developed last year and are in development now. And here we see them, um, actually a student from this semester in a photo taken at the Spokane uh, Fire Lookout Museum that uh, Michael mentioned with Ray Kresek. Ray Kresek, I don't know if you can see him, but he's that uh, gentleman with a stick on the right. And he's an old gentleman who devoted two thirds of his life to document lookouts in the Pacific Northwest. Here's sort of a living testament uh, to how love for a place, uh, which is the national forest system, can become a mission. Um, uh, what I am presenting is the first research-oriented design studio focused on lookouts that has ever been conducted in North America. Uh, this is exciting, but challenging. And because it raises uh, fundamental questions that lack answers in architectural literature, right? So for instance, our look at the building type. Uh, so building types basically represent a way of categorizing building that is ancient but unsurpassed. And this book from 1976 by Pevsner contains a list of building types that have historically made an impact in the field of architecture and have traversed, traversed a variety of architectural styles, you know, see library, theater, museums, and so on. But none of this bear even a remote similarity to lookouts. So the question we asked ourselves at the beginning is, can lookouts be included in this list? And if so, how? And from a special, let's say, characteristic perspective, lookouts basically evoke a world of small objects that silently traverse the history of architecture, each tied to sort of unique individuals. This one that we see here is a square cut measuring about 10 feet uh, on each side overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, where the renowned architect Le Corbusier, the famous architect Le Corbusier spent his holidays and his final years before passing away on the shore in front of this cabin. But this also recalls uh, the huts of philosopher Martin Heidegger, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and uh, was basically built small shelter embodying a profound philosophical thought. Um, um, built on the most remote peaks of the mountains, lookouts uh, basically are vessels for personal stories. Um, and this make basically each lookout different from the others. There's all similar in form, but very different and complex in, in terms of content. And I think that this is the hidden strength uh, of lookouts. So lookouts also tell the story of a major initiative to transform the mountain into both a shared economic resource in the recreational space. The history of lookouts should be understood within this broader context, for instance, of trail development and the creation of small infrastructure. There's a process that began in 1905 with the establishment of the US forest and you know the first chief forester, Gifford Pinchin. And trails were indeed necess necessary for transporting the standard, let's say, size cabin piece, 8 by 8, 10 by 10, 14 by 14, to the mountaintops carried on the back of mules, the so-called 
tech trends. And, and, and then it comes a question, why Idaho, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, why do we consider Idaho to be excellent? And in some ways, a unique uh, place for research on lookout. Well, naturally we can say, we can answer, well, we work in Idaho because the University of Idaho, right? It's a land grant institution, there are many reasons. But there are, well, I think like three main reasons. First, the main reason is that the number of lookout in Idaho is about 1,000. Uh, for precisely, it's 996 records. And this map, I don't know if you can see it, but it shows these kind of swarms of points. The red point are dots that were abandoned, demolished, and the blue point are the still standing ones, right? And the number of lookouts uh, increased dramatically following the Great Fire of 1910 and other events uh, of fire that took place throughout the century, as indicated in the Aryan Reds. And second reason why Idaho is important, because it is the home of the first structure that historically recognized as a fire lookout in Western US. And originally named Thunder Mountain, uh, the Bertha Hill lookout was built in 902, and, uh, and it actually holds this distinction, right? So here we see two of the four, uh, let's say, lookout iteration that have succeeded one another at this place, which is, by the way, still in service every, and still staffed every summer. Third reason why Idaho is important. It relates to the first one. A high number of records suggest that the state of abandonment may also be more pronounced and felt uh, than in other American states. And this state of neglect began in the 60s with the replacement of lookout towers by aircraft and subsequently by satellite methods. And it is now increasingly subjected to vandalism. Mm -hmm. Right. So the mission of the research is thus to serve as both a heritage preservation project and a way to envision a future for this uh, important legacy. The first, uh, um, um, so let's say the first part uh, of the project uh, basically concerns recognizing the gears, the gears of the lookouts. It's basically learning their syntax, uh, like much like learning a kind of a language or a new language. Right, so I deliberately use the word gears because lookouts basically function like machines. And they are optimized to provide all the necess necessary equipment for the staff on duty with minimal space and maximum visibility. The optimization of lookouts as machines for monitoring the territory of pure during the 30s, when basically the construction intensified under the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC established by President uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Here we see some pages of a manual of the 30s which illustrate this kind of standardization effort undertaken by the US Forest Service. And basically each region of the forest uh, system produced their own standardized version of cabins over time. And this grid displays the, uh, the nine, let's say, main documented version of uh, US forest uh, look, uh, lookout towers. However, as mentioned, this classification pertains only the, to the cabin, not to the lookout. This is problematic. So not the lookout in the way they're assembled together to form towers on podium. And this is why to overcome this limitation, uh, the first research task conducted with students was to examine the anatomy of the lookout. So what gives it an identi identity? So we basically identified six components from the bottom corner left. So we have podium, stairway, walkway, cabin, openings, and roof. And for each of these components, students basically created analytical board um, that showcased the variety of configuration with, uh, within each component. It's based on a corpus of hundreds. It was a big work made by students. And here we see, for instance, eight different types of walkways on the left, six different types of cabins. And here we see, uh, same, same for, was done for other components. So we see other types of structural support for the cabin, types of roofs, and here we see uh, different types of openings and the respective percentage of coverage uh, for the surrounding view, and on the right, examples of stairs. And in general, this kind of board represented the first attempt at systematic study of the building components of Lookout that was ever conducted. And, and clearly this is a limited sample that needs to be expanded and requires assistance, right? 
And so um, to complete this operation further, to go ahead, the six classification boards have been integrated into a GIS map. By clicking on the point of the map, it is basically possible to know now which components are actually present or historically documented. In other words, we can determine the type of roof, walkway, stair, opening, podium, windows, each lookout's features. And this tool is connected to the database of the Forest Lookout Association, which is currently the richest source of information available on lookouts. And the goal is to make this platform accessible online as soon as possible so that anyone can contribute to its advancement. And soon, let's say simply by visiting this site uh, without the bulky you know, equipment of the Google, Google people, uh, basically anyone will be able to contribute to this mapping effort, right? Using a smartphone connected to a geographic database with a simplified interface, like the one that we see shown on the right, it will be possible to upload information and about each individual lookout. So, however, this is good, but there is another problem. And the problem is that lookouts are highly customized, highly customized. So, and this complicates classifications, right? And in the 70s, the um, famous architect and his, uh, critic and historian, Charles Chang, introduced a concept. It's called adhocism, the you know, ad hocism, right? <laughs> Which means basically the style of improvisation or the style of putting things together. And this style, in a way, perfectly suits uh, the case of lookouts. Um, because many lookouts exemplarily display this kind of aesthetic of improvisation, right? So faced with material shortages and various difficulties, many cases, uh, basically the staff uh, was in service there improvised. They simply build what they knew. And these cases for improvisation are so numerous that one can truly speak of a sort of hedokist lookout style. This is what I would propose. And for instance, this project carried out by a student last year, Madeline Smith, last semester, worked on this concept, I think, of hedokism, which uh, operates on the lookout uh, called Looking Glass up north, uh, Boundary County, where, by the way, here, a prominent scientist, Harry Gisborne, worked and uh, operated. And to illustrate how Gisborne used to ascend, ascend and descend from a log every day or so um, on, a, on a thing that is typologically known as crow's nest, which is basically a platform on the top of a, of a trunk. Here, Madeline envisioned incorporating the cabin around the trunk. And from this model and rendering, we see how the cabin and the tree basically complement each other. So the crow's nest, the trunk, is integrated into the L4 cabin. And what is result here is really an interesting example of Adokis uh, lookout style. However, the problem is that while the gears are sufficient, uh, let's say to understand the mechanical functioning or the lookout, they tell us basically nothing or uh, about nothing about how the lookouts operate together. Uh, and to understand these operative aspects, we need to observe them in clusters, not alone. And these historical photos showed on the left, a fire watcher basically using the fire finder, which was located at the center of the cabin to identify basically the trajectory of the potential fire, right, the smoke. And on the right side, we see a ranger. And this ranger is probably received, let's say, a call from the lookout on the left, and we probably uh, promptly accused me conduct another lookout to cross-reference information and ultimately potentially situate a fire. Basically, lookout function as a coordinated network. And um, uh, a keen eye and the ability to recognize tiny details from 20 miles away were the requirement for being selected for the stop. This, for example, is a patented eye chart proposed in the 40s, uh, which was placed, let's say, at a progressively greater distance uh, to assess the staff vision. And uh, in addition, there is a second thing concerning the actual visibility of the lookout, which is known as the view shed. Basically, the diagram, this diagram here illustrates that only a portion of the area was visible from a single point, and that would have necessitated another, let's say, lookout on the other side, on, uh, basically facing the opposite direction of the slope's exposure. And uh, to better understand how this cluster of lookouts work together, basically students created uh, this three-dimensional simulation. In this case, we see two basically opposing slopes. We see four lookouts on one side and three on the other side of a valley. And uh, 
And basically on um, each tower complements each other. And we see that puzzle here in this right side of, of the board, right? And, there, and these are kind of other attempts to analyze uh, the relationship that each tower has with the morphology, for instance, uh, on which it is situated. In other words, lookout towers vary in high in configuration based on the landform they occupy. Whether it is a ridge, a crest, a cliff, or another type of terrain, they're going to change. And an, um, another area of research that we have focused on concerns the accessibility of, of lookouts via roads or trails. And this research provided us with valuable data to determine, for instance, which lookouts are accessible to the greatest amount of hikers, for instance. That's an interesting point. And the interconnectedness, interconnectedness among lookouts inspired this project, for instance, by Logan Lesman, which implemented a lightning, uh, let's say, signaling system to revitalize the cluster surrounding the West Fork uh, fire lookout in, the nor nor in north, uh, northern Idaho, which is currently in urgent need of maintenance. Yeah. We go ahead, repair, another very important concept. So this theme of maintenance has basically shaped a series of projects that emphasize not so much the design of new lookouts, but rather the repair and the preservation of existing ones. And during one of the court sessions last spring, uh, Nancy and Don, uh, Don Hammond participated as guest speakers. Mm. Nancy is the author of a book detailing her husband Don's experience as a fire watcher in the 70s at Don Peaks, St. Joe Forest. And what they share with students was not only their passion for lookouts, but also a plea for, um, against vandalism and neglect. And I think that some students have approached their work with this kind of repair and mind, mindset in mind. Um, uh, this intriguing project by Connor Riggs last semester aims to basically integrate the bare mountain lookout with new services and solar panels. And during a conversation that Connor had uh, with a staff member at uh, that lookout, uh, basically he, he learned that the first impression of this uh, uh, fire watcher was that of a pagoda when he went there, right? And so consequently, rather than being like a uh, place a feathered leaf, you know, as is often the case, like the, the solar panel in this case were arranged in the shape of a pagoda, right? Or um, this project by Braden Jones aimed to restore the very famous Willis, um, Wiley's Peak Lookout, which used to sit on a rock, uh, out, a rocky outcrop. And Braden has taken on the challenge of building on this boulder to give the lookout sort of unique architectural character, a structure hanging over the edge, basically in includes a pulley system and basically highlights the cliff's beauty, right? And uh, this project by Juliana and Nelson aims to restore another famous lookout, which is the chicken pig, which is currently in poor condition, located in the Nez Perce forest. And this change might evoke something, right? And since the lookout is well known among fans for its very steep and hip roof, Juliana's approach uh, was to strengthen the roof uh, using four logs placed around the hip rafters, right? And finally, uh, we talked about innovation. Some students worked basically on creating new design for lookouts. Think about really about uh, thinking about the future. For example, Spade Spencer, Spencer Brodnik designed a lookout that is accessible for wheelchair users. And it seems quite a uh, strange that they approach. He basically included ramps that could that, uh, basically go up to the lookout top uh, from the outside. And, and this is an important topic. This is an important topic, especially for older users, right? Because, and passionate. Mm -hmm. um, Simon, Simon Scott suggested breaking down the function of the cabin into different objects placed inside a fenced area, as we see there in the central diagram. And by the way, this design goes back to the early days of lookouts. Uh, by separating the cabin on the ground from the observ observation platform. And I find it very important. When we talk about the future, I think that we suppose that we have to learn from the past, at least to measure if we have really done something innovative or not. It's not simply by, you know, creating the last uh, folded crazy piece, right? And uh, one more example, Andrew Sherman. Andrew Sherman created 
a series of design that adjust the lookout structure to fit the shape of the site, improving its connection to the surrounding. In this example here, basically the ridge of the mountain is mirrored in the walkway that links different parts of the lookout. And the same method was used uh, for the cliff in a second version of the project. Final example that I show, Jacob Billy. Jacob Billy developed a variant of the so-called Aeromoto Tower, which is a very high steel tower that was invented in the 30s, inspired by the windmill towers. And starting from the bare steel structure of the Aeromoto, he basically devised various design strategies to integrate it with new functions while reinforcing its structure and maintaining its internal structural logic. These design proposals were discussed with representatives from the Forest Fire Lookout Association who were invited to participate uh, in the sessions. Here we see session, um, a session attended by uh, Gary Weber. Gary Weber is the director of the, by the way, the association, Forest, Associ um, Look, um, Forest Fire Lookout Association magazine, and excited to see all these young people working on the lookout towers and caring for them um, Gary had us publish an article in the Lookout Network magazine to inform the association member about his ongoing initiative at the University of Idaho. And at the beginning of your journey, I often ask myself if it was worthwhile to work on the Lookout Towers. I wonder if they were a thing of the past and if their story had ended. Uh, was it the end of history? Fukuyama? Fukuyama, you know? Um, However, uh, through my work with the students and, com and, and uh, the collaboration with the uh, uh, associations, I realized that the history of Lookout is not only ongoing, but I suppose it's just begun. Hmm. And most importantly, this story should not be approached passively because it represents a responsibility and I think an opportunity uh, to invest in a unique legacy in Idaho. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Andre and Michael, for an informative and comprehensive but complimentary presentation. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. I know that some of you may need to leave for other classes at uh, 1.30, but uh, I hope that uh, you'll engage our speakers and um, be sure to look at the models of the uh, various lookouts here before you leave. Uh, so if uh, you want, would like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, if you could just introduce yourself, your, your first name, and whether you're a student, alumnus, faculty member, or a, a former fire lookout yourself. Rochelle, yes, please. Question um, I'm curious about is when you're talking about human beings being replaced by sort of post or remote operation. I used to live in New England and it would be really many things like lighthouses. And I was wondering, well, this time the previous generation of the same thing happening. And I was wondering if you, were, if you came across similar projects that dealt with lighthouses or what parallels you can what the next generation of human beings being replaced by other things might be. I don't know. They could, they could go in both, fresh, both directions, the conflict. If you didn't hear the question, it was uh, a parallels between fire lookouts and lighthouses and the process of automating them and uh, whether there are um, maybe parallel studies. So any of you want to yeah. tackle that? Please, uh, Michael. I like this. This is like Tiny Mike style on, <laughs> on YouTube, you know, you can hand it off. Um, so uh, I don't know anything about lighthouses, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak about something I don't know about, but I will say that um, the, the hope with this project was that the, like I said, the, the lookout could serve <laughs> as a composite for this larger question about, you know, um, you know, reducing our, our reliance on human experience, right? And so I think that that's probably part of, you know, tied up in the heritage of lighthouses as well, that you have somebody physically there, you know, watching out for ships that could crash into the coast, but there's a sort of, you know, probably a solace in the way that there's a human being out there, you know? And I think that um, uh, I, I can't speak super directly to that, but I just, I hope that the project does ask some of the larger questions about, um, like I said, you guys kind of like moving away from the, the kind of human experience um, uh, that could probably also be extrapolated to lighthouses as well. Uh, I don't know, Andre, do you have any thoughts on that? Or, okay, yeah, that's kind of my, my thought on that. Well, lighthouses yeah. too. Yeah, well, light, lighthouses are cool, yeah. 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 yeah.
yeah. Other questions, please. So, uh, Bruce, go ahead. Uh, Hand him the mic too. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, did uh, did the uh, question of using um, the towers as uh, uh, for cell phone transmission, et cetera, uh, arise in your studio? Well, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I think everything is good because uh, they keep them preserve them from being abandoned or demolished. That's sure. Uh -huh. The very important thing is to understand them. Uh, I mean, to respect your legacy, which means not simply kind of folding things or, you know, gathering pieces together, but it's understanding the type. Mm -hmm. And this is the first step, I think, in view of the preservation. But, I mean, there is no, uh, everything is good, I think. Uh, there is no, let's say, limitation in terms of program or in terms of integration of functions. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Have either of you um, investigated or thought about or reviewed the use of lookouts in the rental system? <laughs> yeah. I could read this question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so that, I'll just clarify that. So, yeah, so a lot of lookouts are. Being converted into either rentals that are overseen by the Forest Service, or um, quite a few of them have been bought up by private parties and are now being rented out as Airbnb destinations. Um, I I personally think that this sort of decontextualizes the fire lookout from a lot of what Andre and I are talking about is the value of them. So in particular, like you have individuals who are buying these towers. And then literally transporting them to new locations, literally de like kind of decontextualizing the tower from um, you know the mountaintop, right, putting it in the morning in the forest. But I think that uh, uh, the other thing I think of when I think of these rental programs is that it might be a really cool experience for people to go up, but it's not necessarily that experience. The same experience I'm discussing in my project, which is that there's something valuable about having the person place. In one in one spot for a long period of time, and I think that again, I'll get at some of the larger questions the project is asking, which is, um, you know, the way in which uh, nature and the landscape is being commodified in different ways. Right? We live in a, in a time now when, um, you know, like there's like passport programs, national parks, where people are encouraged to sort of you know go around the national parks and visit as many as possible and spend as little time as possible. Um, right, you know, each one there's um there's like swag that says like not all who wander are lost, you know, and it's always kind of it's encouraging this very you know uh, temporary relationship. And I think that um I'm really going off on this right now, but I think that the Airbnb is sort of an extension of that. You know, it's a it's a commodification of um of the lookout. And I hope that um you know projects like this don't, they kind of exist outside of that commodification um, of lookout structures. And so uh, and that was kind of an agenda. Do you have thoughts on that? I 100% agree. Yeah. I, I, again, um, the phenomenological experience of being in a lookout requires time. It's not something, being, <laughs> a, being in a lookout is a phenomenological experience which requires time. And um, being there, face difficulties, challenging conditions. It's not like spending a night, uh, right, or going there. This is why last year, at one point when we had this guest, uh, I suppose they had the impression we were working for some kind of Hilton Hotel, uh, let's say company, because the, the student beginning started like uh, designing these things as hotel beds, like hotel rooms. And, and, and when the guests say, wait, no, 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 wait. It's not a hotel room. Lookout is something else. It's it's a challenging place, and this is what makes it interesting and fun for you know enjoying nature in a different way, and respecting respecting it, not simply going there as you say, and and you know taking advantage of it as a commodity, right? So renting. So I agree that it, it's a quite a sensible topic. It's one of the, the renting system and you know the Airbnbs etc. And I know if that's really the way uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I would say a promising, let's say, program for the future. 
I think maybe it's more um, like deep and and let's say let's say uh, full of, of meaning rather than you know spending it on here. Yeah, right. Thanks. Yeah. I like. I'm just gonna say too. I like just thinking about you know, your your project. You're looking at the different types, and the type isn't hotel. You know what I mean? Like the type is fire lookout, and that's a different thing, right? And so, um, so yeah. Anybody else? Yes, please, Becky. Hi. Um, I was a fire lookout my first summer of Bobcat graduate. That's the New Orleans neighborhood. So I have a spot for it. But the one I was in was decommissioned and then vandalized to really big the And it's been repaired, but I don't think it's for use right now. So I was curious. If you learn anything about the vandalism and why it seems to be such a common occurrence, do you think? And it's not like a crazy name or whatever. Okay. When you make a change on down, but could you repeat the question? The, the question was about was about vandalism and if we if we you know uh, encountered any explanation of why a certain kind of vandalism occurs. And so I think that uh, our answers might be slightly different after having had several conversations around it. And so I think that there are certain versions of vandalism. Uh, this is going to be controversial. There are certain versions of vandalism that I don't think are inherently bad. So if you go into some of these lookouts. You'll find that, um, you know, Chicken Peak, for instance, I'm going to uh, point out Chicken Peak, that's one that we travel to for our project. When we go to Chicken Peak, you know, etched on to the old podium or like the initials of lovers collected over the years, you know, it, it's kind of sweet and it tells a kind of story. But then you're right, then there's these other versions where people are, you know, spray painting profanity and cutting off the, um, you know, the legs of fire lookouts. And I don't know, I think that's just like you put a new structure out in an unoccupied area long enough. Like, I don't know if that's purely a lookout problem, but it's one that could be solved, I suppose, if somebody wants to get out there. Do um, you have thoughts on that? I mean, I would. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> uh, vandalism can be. Um, you know, an iconoclast act, right? I remember sometimes at the newspaper, the newspaper in Italy received news about someone like throwing um, like uh, something uh, on a statue, right? To, to, to damage it. And, and these kind of things are well, sometimes understood as sort of artistic act, but at least right there, uh, someone, you know, there's like sort of a crowd around in Florence, you can imagine the center of a big city. I have no explanation why you think that in the middle of nowhere, such a remote place. Uh, what uh, you know, vandalism started immediately after um, the petroleum system turns basically to aircrafts and satellites. Uh, those aircrafts. It was 1976, John Grossbanner uh, was an uh, employee at the US Forest Service, um, the engineering department, wrote an essay. Of that 1976, and uh, he understood that the thing was I mean, it's not something that happened like in the 80s and the 90s after like 20 or 30 years, it, 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 it happened immediately afterwards. And that's something that when we plan the thing, we have to keep in mind is that they should be continuously occupied. See, I mean, it's like, in probably, uh, this is this is why the name lookout evokes a person in a structure at once. Lookout is a person, but also the, the architecture. They are, it's like a shell, you know, like a snail, if you want to make, to make a metaphor, right? And if one of the two is missing, all right, something is not gonna, it's not gonna work, right? So, so I think that, that that's one point to keep in mind. Um, and um, yeah, but precisely, I mean, in regard to, to vandalism, I'm not sure. Thanks for yeah. one, one more question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so, do you think? You just mentioned how the vandalization happened immediately after people started being taken out of lookouts. Do you think that could be an argument towards having people in lookouts versus machinery? Because people are more likely to vandalize machinery and inanimate objects than they are if it's someone's home. They'd probably lock them up tight if, uh, if there was extensive machinery in there. Oh. Um, I know. I know. Yeah. I, I would like to expand a little bit on something we were saying though that probably has something to do with both of these questions, and that is this idea of keeping a, a human being there. And I just think from I, I like that you pointed out fire lookouts as a kind of technology as well, and it's a technology that 
um, you know, requires a human being to be there. So if the human being's not there, it's something else. It's not a fire like other people are, right? There's, um, we, I know we've had conversations about how there's a type of dialectic that um, is present in, in fire like that. And so, um, you know, it, it's like, yeah, there's the vandalism argument, and I think that's, you know, okay, we don't want to see that. But also, I just think that, um, you know, they, if, if these things have meaning, the only reason they have the same meaning is because we have a human being there. It's just, I think that's kind of simple. Um, so, I don't know other thoughts on that. But yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. I invite you to come back next week to this space, 1230, Tuesday, October 15th, to learn about the hows, whys, and why nots of creating educational video games. Before you go today, I hope that you'll look at the, these models and have um, a, a treat to celebrate Malcolm Renfrew's birthday. But uh, <laughs> let's thank the